Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. We have so many guests on this show making a difference in our lives, making a difference all around the world with the expertise that they bring. And yet so many of you are reaching out to me saying, you want more. It's not enough just what we're putting on these podcast episodes for you. And so I am here to extend a very warm welcome to you to our Difference Maker community where you can join for as little as $5 a month to get all this extra content out the gate, you're going to get 30 plus mini sods of exclusive content not available for the regular podcast listeners and an exclusive mini sode every month. And you'll get exclusive voting power to help us pick podcast topics and more. And that's with our changers tier. There's three different main tiers and then an extra uh, larger tier. But whatever tier that you join at, you will be included in this extra content and I know that many of you are wanting to go a little bit deeper. And so even though it gets a little wild in there sometimes because of how deep we go, I want you to join us there. This extra content is very special. It means a great deal to me to be a part of this community with you. And I would love to just exchange uh, ideas or perspectives that you have around these different episodes. And that's the place where we do it. So please show up to our Difference Maker community. Give us $5 out of your pocket every month. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun in there because we do. And I would love for you to join us. So go to patreon.com slash a world of difference to join us there. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm Lori Adams Brown, and this is a podcast for those who are different and want to make a difference. Today, we have a very special return guest whom you will remember from before, Michelle Ferregno Warren. We're so happy to welcome her back to the show for her release of her latest book, Join the Resistance, Step into God's Work of Kingdom Justice. And Michelle is the president and CEO of Virago Strategies, a consulting firm for civic engagement campaigns impacting poor communities. She's also the author of The Power of Proximity. She co-founded Open Door Ministries, a community development 501c3 corporation in downtown Denver to address poverty, addiction, homelessness through social programs. And Michelle has been working in Christian community development for 29 years, utilizing her skills as an educator, worship leader, nonprofit manager, public policy specialist, and faith-rooted activist. With policy expertise in economic justice and human service issues, she has served as advocacy and strategic engagement director for the CCDA and done coalition work with the National Immigration Forum. Michelle is a senior fellow with the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute and an adjunct faculty at Denver Seminary. Her advocacy work has been featured in local Colorado markets like the Denver Post, Colorado Public Radio, also media outlets like, of course, the New York Times, the LA Times, PBS NewsHour, Christianity Today, CBN, World Magazine, Sojourners, and numerous others where you have read her work. She holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Cedarville University and a master's in public administration from University of Colorado. And she lives in Denver, in Denver's West Side neighborhood, and she has three adult children. I know you remember her from before, but she's on again, and I'm so excited to welcome once again the one and only Michelle Ferrigno Warren. Hello, Michelle. Welcome back to the A World of Difference podcast today. How are you doing in Denver? I'm doing well. Lori, it's so good to be with you. Thank you so much for this invitation to return. Of course. I'm glad that you wanted to come back on, and I'm very excited to introduce the world along with you to your new book, which is very exciting, and I got to read a little bit of it um, ahead of time, so thank you for reaching out about that, and I just want to give you a chance to sort of help us understand this baby that's been born into the world that you've worked so hard on. Um, I know that part of your book, you have kind of three different parts about serving the movement, um, staying at the table, and you ask us to help help your people, right? To walk. So walk us through maybe like a high level synopsis of why you wrote this book and, um, and why people should read it. Yeah. So I am a justice seeker and doer and I'm just really, I'm just trying to join Christ in his restorative work in the world. And I have wanted to write a book about the work of doing justice, not talking about it, not just the, you know, just talking about the theology of, but what does it really look like in a grassroots, long-term way to seek the welfare of the city by 
doing justice. And years ago, IVP was so, I was so grateful when they said that I could write a book, but that I wasn't ready to write that book, not because I didn't have things to share, but that I had come from a really unique audience as, you know, I have both Catholic and evangelical roots. I have a more privileged, educated, you know, higher level um, socioeconomic status. And it's just like, how did you go from where you are to even understand injustice happens and then how to engage it in a way that is within solidarity of the community. So they wanted me to write a book on proximity and that really was an important, I share that because it's really important to the second book because while we need to do justice and aggressively and now we need to understand who we are and how we step into that work. And for people that look like me, that come from my background, the only way to really do the work of advocacy within, and for me, it was advocacy alongside communities impacted by racial and economic oppression, it would have to be through proximity. And so you can't fix problems you don't understand. Right. And so you have to lean in. We're not fighting for issues. These are real people with real um, you know, voices and, and things in the, that are high stakes in what's happening. And so we need to join them. So that was the very first book. And then the second book is really a very practical way to engage the work of justice and actually specifically around systemic injustice. So you know, individual restoration satisfies, you know, the justice of God through Christ, our peace, and then, you know, social justice or that societal response is so paramount, but we can't stop there. You know, Christ is at, at work restoring all things, individuals, societies, and systems. And so this book specifically talks at that level on how do we engage in justice because it doesn't just happen and it doesn't repair itself. So that is what the book of Join the Resistance. I guess there's probably, there's so much that we're going to talk through, but as far as a high level overview, and thank you for the opportunity to share a little of that progression, because I don't want us to go out of order and all of a sudden join without understanding a little bit, is, is that one, the movement or the pain or injustice that we see, and then we choose to step into the work of reversing injustice, that movement, that ongoing up hill stream of fighting for justice does not begin when we become aware of it, that it has been going on, you know, beyond American history, beyond just our understanding, but really from the beginning of time, and that we join in the work that dates back all the way from when everything that was created good and connected and functioning became very broken. And so just like the prophets and Jesus and John the Baptist, we stand on their shoulders. And the names we don't know, right, of people who have been resisting injustice and oppression. And so that's a good work to step into, and we have a good le legacy as, as Christians. So the book is in three parts. And while in a book, you have to write to an audience. So I wrote to a white Christian audience. That doesn't mean as somebody who has led advocacy campaigns and done this work for decades, these three principles apply no matter what, although the book has a special step into a community that maybe isn't as directly impacted. But the three ways that you join the resistance and that you step into the work of kingdom justice, which is the title of the book, is first you serve the movement means you don't come in with your ideas. It doesn't mean you come in with your agendas. You come to be a student of the resistance, to serve the movement, to learn, and to join where asked. The second one is you stay at the table, and that's the discipline. I mean, everyone wants to talk about the table, but really the discipline is in staying. This is a long arc work, right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is very famously quoted for his for what he said, which is, the arc of the moral, I mean, that the, that the work of justice is long, but I mean, that the, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. It's a slow work. And so we have to stay. And then finally, help your people is really a call to coalitions and bridge building. We're never going to get this work done if we cannot build bridges, sometimes back to the people. We have the most influence alongside both building and bridging social capital helps strengthen the voice, the collective voice, so that we can all speak into it together. 
It's so good. I love those different three parts that you put in there. And I love that you're writing and just being honest about your perspective. I think it's so important in work like this to just recognize we have a perspective. And I really enjoyed the different parts of your book where you talked about, um, you know, when you joined a Black Lives Matter protest with your um, newly (laughs) graduated high school student um, after George Floyd and how there were (laughs) these people who was clear this is their first time to protest, a lot of like white people, especially even white men, white boys, and try to push themselves to the front. And um, yeah, and I think like that lens is so important. I think you wrote, um, didn't they know that they were there to join and add their voices, not push them to the front? So, you know, how you talk about how you show up is just as important as showing up. And so help us understand why that matters. Yeah, so that is sort of the opening story of the book. And, you know, you want to frame a message in a, in a more current context. And so my son was a senior and he had just graduated around the time that George Floyd was murdered. And so we're in this, this flow, this, you know, it was sort of like it wasn't just a march. There was almost a celebration in some ways because DPS, the public schools, were being highlighted that day. Mm-hmm. And so they had all the DPS graduates. And so some of his friends were up in that truck. And so some of it was the celebration of Black Lives, but also the deep grief on how they are disregarded and de- dehumanized and murdered. And so, you know, it, there was a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. It almost could have felt a bit like a parade, especially if this was novel to you. But you have Black men and Black women and children leading the front of the line, and it was somber. And there was a lot of activity up the front, and white people were either hanging very far back, but I saw a lot of teenagers, and I did see several white men push Black women out of the way to get a a better view. And it broke my heart because I was just like, wow, you know, you, you make us look bad. And you may feel like you're better than the other white people who aren't there. And we're really grateful that you've acknowledged that this is something to not just commentate or bear witness to, but to join. But as you join, you need to be more culturally and socially competent. Your behaviors are, you know, we always have stereotypes, which is bad thinking, but they're created for a reason, you know, and we have to, if you're going to come and be a part of the work, whether it's a march or this book really talks about the work between marches, you know, if you're going to come, then you need to be a student. You need to realize that we, we have not been waiting for you to save us, but we have been waiting for you to join us. And so if you can show up, to join and to learn and to understand that this is not something that you should be leading in, then we welcome you. And I I share a couple of illustrations of leaders of color and even in my city that really want to hold an open posture, but they aren't quiet about the behaviors of people who want to step in. I think one of the things that I want to highlight, because this book has a theological Um, foundation for this kind of work. And so often this is seen in many churches as, I mean, not the black church, the black church is is a whole response of resistance. I want to at least call that out. Many churches and specifically, you know, many white churches that, you know, this is not something that Christians do. Absolutely. It is something that people of faith and Christians do as a, as a public witness. And so two theological pieces is one, you know, first John three eighteen. you know, you can't keep talking, you know, you can't just show your love and words and speech, but in action and in truth. And the most honest action is the most public of action because nobody wonders where you are when you are making it public. So that's one thing. But then the second thing really on how you show up is really to recognize that Micah 6-8, which is very used and it is a very practical way to honor and follow God's heart, you know, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, tussle with Micah on his order, but I am going to say that I wish people like me who were joining, especially on those front ends, would start with not do justice or even love mercy, but to walk humbly. Because when we walk humbly, it informs the way we do justice and the way we love mercy with integrity. Mm, That's really good. Yeah. 
There's so much to learn. And when we look at where we are, it's uncomfortable for many people. I think mostly uncomfortable for people who have power. We all have power, even a newborn baby, as Diane Lamberg would say, has power to wake her parents up in the night, right? Which is why it needs to be redeemed. But <clears throat> for those of us who have power, white privilege, white supremacy that's benefited, you know, both you and I throughout our lives. Um, it's important to find where we are and where we have power. And so it can be um, somehow some people, because you're writing to a mostly white audience, but, um, you know, I have Asian friends who, you know, where you are on the hierarchy, whether you're in Asia as a Asian um, individual, whether you're Asian American Pacific Islander in the Bay Area or Idaho <laughs> listening, all of like your location really matters in terms of how that power and privilege shows up. But, um, and there's a lot of people who talk about, you know, social justice, biblical justice, and you use the word kingdom justice, that phrase. So explain that choice for you and how you see those being different for people that are listening. Well, I don't really know if it is different because so many ways that, that we phrase it is cultural. Um, but I, because I do think biblical justice is theological. I think social justice is theological. I think kingdom justice is theological. But what I was trying to share in this particular book and the message of this book is that this is kingdom work. This is good work. This is the good work of the kingdom. This is the slow work of the kingdom. You know, Jesus, his whole purpose in being our peace, you know, and that's, you know, we, I can take us a theological, you know, line of, of that restore, that shalom where nothing is broken and everything is restored, you know, that he is our peace and that he has come. He's done the work that he said he's going to do, you know, that he was going to do to connect what was broken. And he invites us into being agents of his kingdom and his kingdom witness now. And so, well, I think the word, I know the word justice is a biblical word, you know, mish, mishpat and even the concept of justice, but the actual word of justice is all throughout the Old Testament and it's linking to righteousness, but, and also in the New Testament, the Greek word for righteousness and justice are the same. And so I, I really truly think if we were just to switch those words every time we saw righteousness and that particular Greek word to justice, we probably would see the New Testament, you know, in, in as powerful justice as it's intended to be, you know, that justice that, hung, that, that we hunger and we thirst after and we long for and that we want to join. That is, that is the work that Jesus, you know, mishpat, the word justice is to restore to productivity, to connectivity. The Hebrew word tov, which we were all created and, you know, very good and yet, you know, humankind when God breathed his spirit on us, but that's, that was all connected and functioning. It was a beautiful, uh, comprehensive, holistic word. It wasn't just, oh, that's a good cup of coffee. You know, it was like, it was good. It worked, it functioned. And that was, that was the curse. Everything that was connected now was broken mm -hmm. and that Christ is prophetically you know, introduced and then comes as the restorer, the peace, the shalom, the one who will connect us all so that we can have justice. And so I wanted to really tie the work of Christ and his kingdom of rest and his restorative work in the world. Like I said, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says that, you know, literally Jesus's whole sacrifice was this redemptive peace bringing and peacemaking process for the purpose of reconciling all things to himself. That justice is not a liberal word. It isn't a second. It's a, it's a holistic God foundation of God's throne word. And that it's the long work of the kingdom that we join Christ in doing. So, yeah. So I just really wanted to open up the prophetic imagination mm -hmm. to kind of borrow, um, borrow some language from the elders who have gone before us, you know, this prophetic imagination that we, we should be on the forefront of doing the work because Christ is on the forefront of it. And so we want to be a part of his kingdom justice work here on earth. So good. So, so good. Um, we're, um, the series that we're in now is actually called restore. Um, and it involves all things. Mm -hmm. Like you said, how can we restore all the things that are broken as we're trying to make a difference? Because that, um, there's no area of human flourishing that God does not care about and want to restore. And that is part of the, the full picture of what the gospel is all about in my estimation, my understanding, and I'm not alone. Many people feel this way around the world and have for many years. 
um, that it's more than just what we often refer to as like a penal substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died, paid for us with his body and his blood and rose again. Yes, beautiful, wonderful, life-changing throughout history. That has been the moment. But Would there- it make it without it? Would it make it without it? Like yeah. core? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very core. Um, But it wasn't the only thing that happened, right? It's like you mentioned Genesis to Revelation for those of us who read those scriptures, um, but also just what we do now, like the the story we're writing today in our world to bring Tov, to bring the goodness in all its forms into the world. So um, I want to talk, I I love talking about your book, but I always feel like if we talk too much, people be like, I don't need to buy it anymore. (laughs) So I want to definitely make sure. I I do want you to buy it. I'm going to show a picture. There you go. Yeah. Can I tell a few things? Can I tell you a few things about sure. it that may not normally come up? I've been yeah. doing some podcasts and radio shows, and this never comes up. Okay. <laughs> so so I want to at least point out a few things. One, the first one, I did not do a study guide right away, and you had to download it off of IVP, and I got a lot of flack. Why didn't you do a study guide? Okay. So that's that one. This one is in it, so you don't have to worry if you want to do this book together with other people. Each section has a study guide. The second thing is I'm a worship leader. I'm a musician, I'm an artist, and I have been singing, you know, whether it's sad songs or hopeful songs and everything, joy, all be in between. Song is very powerful. Actually, it's a powerful resistance. It is. In the face of death and dying Mm -hmm. and brokenness, we bring our songs literally to the streets. And so at the end of every chapter, actually even some sprinkled throughout, but at the end of every chapter, I have a QR. I tell a little bit about one of the songs of resistance and you can listen to it. I actually have a Spotify playlist that I was using to listen to and be excited. Not all of the songs made it into the book, but, um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to share that song is a powerful action in the work of resistance, it helps us stay rooted in our joy, but it also helps us sing forth the hope of what we want. That's awesome. And I'd love for you to share your Spotify playlist. We can put it in the show notes. I'm all about using songs. I'm not a worship leader, but um, even it's our- okay. That's okay. It's okay. Yeah. But uh, music is very much part of my life and my family's life. And it has definitely helped me to lament and to mourn and to be upset and be really, you know, angry and (laughs) all the things. Music can do that, especially for somebody who's a strong T on the Myers-Briggs. I really need people to give me songs to help me feel my feelings. Um, is that my thing? I never did that before. Oh, it's my thing. And as an eight, I, I like have this anger, but I'm afraid to express it as a woman. And so sometimes like a song will just kind of help me be like, Oh, yeah, it's okay to be a little angry about that. So thank you. I would love to see your yeah. po- Spotify playlist and we will link it in the show notes if you send it. But I wanted to dig into this sure. question. Um, speaking of being a woman, um, we're both women <laughs> and we care about women. And um, sometimes I get asked, and I would love to pose this question to you. As a woman, what do you believe is important to emphasize about social justice when it comes to women in particular? We've been at the front end of the work of all throughout history, and the guys often get the credit. (laughs) Yeah, for real. It's really true. I mean, like, that's the the one thing that I think about is women are gutsy, and they're willing. And, you know, you you just, I don't, I mean, I don't want to take away from anything that men have done and and so many great leaders, but often there's a woman behind it. I'm going to give you an illustration of Brown versus Board of Education. Okay. So I'm a policy person. Yeah. So that's what I didn't, I decided not to go to seminary, although I teach at a seminary. Um, Alexia Salvatierra calls me an organic theologian, which I was like, do you remember that organic like smells? Like that's not, a <laughs> right. um, but anyways, I have a degree in policy. So I think political, I mean, policy wise and structure wise, it's just sort of my orientation when I read my theology. When I, you know, read my Bible, when I look at problems in the world. So Brown versus Board of Education, for those who may not be familiar, was a really important act um, from the Supreme Court that reversed this idea that separate but equal is okay. So there was this other piece of legislation called Plessy v. Ferguson that said, okay, you can have separate drinking fountains, you can have separate schools, as long as everybody has equal access, you can separate. Now, we know that there wasn't equal access, you know, the schools that were white had new textbooks and better teachers and you know, at least, you know, had more access to teachers who had higher levels of education, et cetera. Um, and, but that had been like the law of the land until Mr. Brown sued 
to, you know, sued to in this particular Kansas Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit. But here's the thing. Mr. Brown wasn't even the original person. It was all of these women who wanted their kids to be able to go to the white school that one was closer to their house and two had better options for them. And they knew that they weren't going to get taken seriously. And so Mr. Brown, of course, had those problems too. And they threw him on the lawsuit so it could be presented that this man wants it because even a black man has more power than a black woman. And I will say this power and agency are two different things. Mm -hmm. All of those women had agency. Right. And they used it. Yeah. And they were smart and they were savvy. And even though they probably were angry that their bodies and their voices were, you know, marginalized, you know, as far as even to black men, but they had serious agency and they walk, worked in such a shrewd way that history has completely changed as a result of those women inviting Mr. Brown into their lawsuit. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's crazy. So that may not have been the question really, but I do think it's important to understand. I guess I've heard the phrase, you know, behind every good man is a good woman, whatever, you know, <laughs> behind every good movement is a woman. <laughs> yeah. In general. Yeah, exactly. No, it's true. Like I was, um, you know, the um, Voices of Lament book. I'm not sure if you've read it, but so many different friends, you know, have been a part of it. Like, oh, 100. I love that book. I'm, I'm working my way through the signatures. Like, I get to see my friends around yeah. the country, and so I'm trying to bring it everywhere. I miss Sandra Van Opp still at the Justice Conference. I forgot to bring it. Oh but, no! But yes, I'm next walk, time. I'm walking through. I've got some plans. That's yeah. so awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um in uh the chapter of um where you know at the end of it, kind of like in your book, you have a song at the end everybody has like a person they're highlighting. And so um, Carmelita Torres was highlighted in there and it was like, wow, my gosh, she was so young coming across the border from Mexico to El Paso in the early part of um, I think it was 1917, something like that. And it's like women, all the Mexicans coming across the time, like, oh, they have lice. And so they're pouring kerosene on them and DDT and just horrible, awful, like human rights abuses. And then taking pictures of the women naked and then putting them up in El Paso for these like people in the bars to like gawk at. And so this young woman, like 17 or something is like, I'm not getting off the trolley. I'm, I'm just not, I'm just going to stay here. And we don't know what happened to her. But this young girl, so brave. And then you think of Rosa Parks, she didn't get off the bus. She said no. And then you think of this hijab-wearing woman in Iran, Masa Amini, like 22 years old, and she died for the cause. It's like women are strong and we stand up, but we often do pay a price with our bodies and our lives in ways that maybe men don't. And so, yeah, I don't know, like what's your perspective on that as a woman with social justice using the power that men bring to get the things going ahead, but also how do we get people to understand how to protect women and care for them in the process? Yeah. Yes. I would love to talk about that and sort of the multiple marginalizations. I do think that today's story is not the same as a hundred years ago. I think the women, women are just not putting up with the same thing. We do not have the level of representation we need or deserve, you know, even in formal Um, places of power. But I do believe that women continue to practice their own agency. They pass it on to their daughters and, and we continue to make, you know, shatter glass ceilings. Like this is, this is not our mother's world. This is not our grandmother's world. And I'm grateful for my mother and my grandmother and those have gone before. So I at least want to say that this is not the same world. Thank God. But that does not mean that even globally, there is not incredibly harsh. I mean, femicide is a real thing. Right. And many people don't even know the world, the word. Yeah. So I'll just let your listeners go do a little research. Yeah. On femicide. Hey, I'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me just say this. The work of justice is an expensive work. Jesus even demonstrated for that, whether de- demonstrated that for us, you know, in the emptying of privilege, the living a life on the margins, pushing back on the injustice and oppression. You know, Jesus came to rehumanize the dehumanized. Anybody who was being dehumanized, their oppressors did not like Jesus. That was a lot of people with formal power. Yeah. And so he continued to do that and they killed him. Yeah. Now I know that was supposed to be the redemptive part of God's plan, but let's not underestimate the fact that he was murdered by the state right. because of his pushing for the oppressed to be heard and pushing against the powers of that day to expand what 
you know, the goodness and all the things that the love of God was supposed to be for all people and not just for them. Mm. So, you know, so we follow, we follow Jesus who it would cost him his life. Right. And that's sort of the reality is, you know, I think we kind of know what happened to the woman in El Paso. I actually almost put her in our, my book, mm. the story though. We, she disappeared. Yeah. You think that she didn't get killed. I mean, right. I don't know why we would dance around that. Right. You know, that her, her story is over. So I, I'm just going to say my guess is she was murdered right. because that is the history of women. I mean, even if you look at all of the women they murdered on, um, because we were witches, you yeah. know, because we spoke up right. and we went against the status quo and we told the church what we thought to be true and right. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of mess in history with women, but I want to say one, yes, the cost is great no matter who it is. However, there are two, there's sort of multiple marginalizations. So when my husband and I have the same idea, and this has been going on for 20 years, <laughs> when I have a comment about the poor, the immigrant, you know, racial injustice, he has the same thought and he is called a good thinker and I'm called a flaming liberal. <laughs> That's, that's important. Yeah. Women say the same thing and it's somehow I've got to be tagged as some negative right. or pejorative res- reference. And I do often say that most of, and I'll say the church, cause this isn't true of everybody, but most of the church, at least the rooted church from where I come from, my original roots, they would rather just maybe arm candy with my mouth quiet. Yeah. So, so that's one thing as a woman. I'm denigrated for what I say. I'm disrespected for what I'd say as though somehow my mind is not connected to my mouth and that my mouth is not connected to my body. These are intentional words I'm using. Yep. These are in many ways dangerous acts mm-hmm. in societal structure, in financing for nonprofit work, in opportunities to speak in different institutions. I mean, like they will silence the voice of prophets. So yes, you have an extra marginalization as a woman, but then if you're a woman of color, you have another mantle yep. that is added to you. Yep. And so, you know, th- that may give you a little bit of a picture of what we're sharing is I don't want to, nobody doing the work of justice will have an easy road. If you're doing it and it's easy for you, you're probably not doing justice. Yeah. So good. So important to point it out. I think sometimes it's, um, you know, we're talking about perspectives earlier. Some people don't have that perspective. And so um, it's important to name the stereotypes, even though they're not good to have, right? But it helps us understand how to overcome them. We can't know how to overcome something if we don't know how we got here. And so, you know, as women, we often just breathe in this air. I don't know if you... um, you know, have much experience with this in terms of uh, how to help people walk through it. But, you know, I know many women I talk to, it's, we're often told advocating, advocating for others is okay, but not advocating for yourself. So like women doing the work of women's work, it has a whole other tone. And so um, maybe, you know, women are tempted to focus on other social justice issues like save the babies or religious justice or even racial justice, immigration, all those are good issues. Um, but, but, but at the expense of our own about, you know, women. And so, yeah, how can we be better, um, to advocate for women as women and go against these stereotypes where, because we get seen as too much, you know, that stereotype about women, uh, or hysterical, um, when we do work for our own gender. So yeah, what are your thoughts around that? <laughs> I'm kind of laughing because I'm a woman, but I think another multiple marginalization is I originally am from New York and I'm Italian. <laughs> and anytime I share that, people are like, oh, that makes so much sense. And it's usually not something complimentary. It's like, you are just too much. <laughs> right. um, you know, I, I know how to behave, but, but you know, what's going to happen in the end? Yeah. I mean, there is, there is definitely um, things that we can contribute to that conversation and I don't know if you want to even narrow the convers that that question a little bit more. Sure. I want to do it justice, yeah. right? Yeah, and maybe I can even put it back on you a little bit to even narrow it a little bit more so that I can even more accurately. Um, yeah, I, as a woman, when we put other issues before our own, and we don't, for example, we've not passed the ERA. It's been fifty years that that. That's right. And um, I think men need to be involved, but if women aren't standing up for the ERA. Like how, how is there any hope? And of course we care about all the other issues. We care about immigration. We care about pro-life. We care about babies. We care about all of it. But if we are always on the back burner as women fighting for ourselves, like how do we move forward? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing that I had to actually really learn early on because I was a part of that culture too. So I'll just tell you what white 
you know, I have, like I said, I have Catholic and evangelical roots, but as a product of the Christian school movement, you know, very, I think evangelical is now the replacement word for fundamentalism, you know, growing up in that very cloistered environment as a, as a young woman who was seeing things in the world and not exactly sure, you know, what to do with it. There was a lot of scripture thrown in our direction as, as girls about this meek and quiet spirit, which, you know, Jesus was meek. He says he was gentle. He was meek and lowly. He talks about that in Matthew 11. So yes. So may women be meek like Jesus. Right. <laughs> and, and turn to the tables, right? But, <laughs> but I, but what white culture taught me as a woman is to be afraid and to not rock the boat. Mm. And that is peacekeeping. And peacekeeping does not change the status quo. So first of all, that is what we have to be honest, is that what is peace and what is peacemaking? Peacemaking is being willing to see the evil, hear the evil, and speak the evil boldly to stay remained in that evil and overcome it with good and work towards its repair, right? So that that's just what we as agents of salt and light are supposed to do in the world. That's the role of peacemaking. Yeah. And in order to be able to live and work at peace, there must be justice. And so we as women, one, need to understand the cultural lies. We do not rock. We do rock boats. We are, we are people of peace, which means we're people of restoration. It means we are people who are honest and we stay in the work. So that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is, and I, like I said, this, I really also learned kind of on the front end is that your advocacy on behalf of someone else will only be as strong as your advocacy for yourself. Mm, that's good. We've kind of cloaked this lie in nobility, like, oh, you're going to be such a good advocate for somebody else. But if you don't believe that you deserve to be treated with human dignity and respect and justice. And if you haven't learned to raise your voice on behalf of your own well-being, I'm not saying you can't lift your voice for somebody else, but you will be stopped. I mean, that's the whole point of resistance is you, if you start to advocate for them, you will feel that resistance, Yeah, but you will not have grown the rootedness in who you are and the purpose for which why your voice matters that you will shrink back mm. in ways that you will look back and say, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Or you may retreat altogether. Mm. And that I truly believe no matter what race and culture you come from, that until you can advocate for yourself, until you believe you are worthy of having voice for your own rights and privileges, you will not be as effective of an ad advocate for others. Mm. That's so good to think through. And I know that that um, truth bomb is resonating around the world right now as people listen. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a hard one, and it's it's our own work to do. I think when you work on behalf of others, you it's personal. It's not something you can hold at arm's length, and it takes all of you. And it's that's why it's such hard work to do. And most people would rather just keep their head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. But like you say in your book, injustice doesn't solve itself. It doesn't just go away. Yeah, yeah, you don't fall into the work of repair. You just don't. You have to intentionally step into it because it's such a courageous public face, public front facing work. Yeah. yeah. It's just incredibly, incredibly important and costly. It is. So as someone who cares about politics from this lens and how it can be used for good, there's a lot of conversation going on right now around Christian nationalism in the United States. And so there's a good way to engage in politics um, in the work of justice through politics. And there's a bad way <laughs> that's like going to do harm to both Christianity and our, you know, being a patriot. All of it's just going to suffer, in my opinion. I would love for you to speak about how politics can be involved in kingdom justice from your perspective as someone who has run for office and cares deeply about that. Yeah. So I, I think part of it is I need to strip away or at least help detangle some of what the word politics even means. Because I think we think about it in like a two-party system in the United States. We kind of think of different news agencies and social media, and we can't talk about politics. Of course, we can't talk about religion either. And I'll just say as a sidebar, married to a pastor, I mean, like literally when my husband David and I walk in, we make you nervous. You know? <laughs> politics and religion is just walked in. I mean, we have yeah. very good cultural filters. We won't make you feel uncomfortable, but that is the reality of who we are. Right. But, yeah, I just what I what I think is really important is for us to understand that everybody plays politics 
Politics is a game that is played to get what we need to get done. You need to be shrewd and you need to be savvy and you need to understand that people in power are playing games to see how they can get their agenda done. Sometimes their agenda is for good. Sometimes it's for evil. But politics is that necessary game that needs to be played. Here, I'll go back to like the two or three-year-old. I'm a mom. I mean, my kids are all adults now. But, you know, I also was a child. It was sort of the infamous at about three, a child will begin to determine which parent to ask for which things because they'll know who's going to say yes or no. <laughs> That's so true. That is when we become shrewd. Okay, if I do this timing, if I do this timing. And that, we play politics in our marriage. We play it at Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, like, it doesn't have anything to do with public policy in the United States. We are trying to figure out how we can get things forward. So that happens in every institution. What is interesting about public policy is that that kind of politics is very, very dangerous because people think about it in frameworks of their winning, of winning and losing. Like my side needs to win instead of really understanding that justice is above the political fray and who is losing when everybody is just fighting. And that's the reality is politics has become such a game of winning and losing and we all perpetually lose when that's the dynamic. When we don't realize that the point is to be shrewd so that we can get things done in a way that is utilitarian and for the common good. So every single person who is in office at the federal level has to like kind of sort of the raising of the Bible. I will uphold the Constitution and these documents that we have kind of on record that we would have this type of country with liberty and justice for everyone. And that everything that we do is supposed to be what we call for the welfare of the common good. And what that means is we understand that policies sometimes have unintended consequences. That's why it's in contract form. We're supposed to be willing to change it when we realize that people on the margins are not benefiting from the same thing. But policies are enacted with a utilitarian mindset in play, which is I want to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people. And so all of us who are maybe not in power, but we are seeing how these policies, policies impact us, we need to realize that that voting, by the way, everybody go out and vote. I mean, even doesn't matter even who you vote for. I mean, I think it matters who you vote for, but I'm not trying to push that. I'm just saying, be involved. Right. We all get the government we invest in. And civic engagement that's tied to civic responsibility and paying attention to who's losing and winning and using our voice, that is not a sideline sport. We are both a democracy and a republic. We vote for people, but then we hold them accountable all the time for the way we see things, not to be divisive, but to make sure that we stay congruent with those foundational documents that care about the welfare of the common good. And that has been stuck probably from the beginning, but is definitely stuck now where we lift up caucus power. We lift up, we lie about the people who are on our team just so that we can protect some version of, of a country that we think we want to instead of recognizing it's supposed to be for all the people. And we need to work together to make sure that it's just and yeah. that we're, we're honest. Again, honesty and working for repair. So so voting is good, but I, and I want people to vote, but I want you to understand that that is the lowest hanging fruit of civic engagement. And that's why this book that I write talks about the ways that you get involved. You need your voice. We want you to show up for the marches. We want you to show up to vote. But we'd like you to be at the table between the marches, and we'd like you to be holding your you know legislators accountable. I mentioned already in this podcast that I teach a political I taught a political political advocacy class at Denver Seminary, and I would ask a series of questions, kind of like, "Why did you join this class as pastors? What do you want to advocate for?" Everybody scribbled down paper things on their paper. I never asked them to say it out loud. So eager and excited, then I'd say the second question: How long do you plan to work on it? <laughs> and then the, you can tell the energy in the room is just like, oh, I think this is a trick question. Like three to five years is not probably what she wants. And then I would ask, you know, how many people do you know that are directly impacted? By the third question, I think they all wanted to quit the class. Like, okay, we know where she's going with this. I stink. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like commentating around politics is what kind of gets your juices flowing. But like, let's have a real conversation about right. what we're learning why we're learning advocacy skills and how can we do justice in the public square. 
So good. You know, and so those are really, really important, you know, things to evaluate. But as far as like our civic engagement, we really need to stay engaged Mm -hmm. in an ongoing level. And in this class, I also would ask, I'd start by raise this one I did publicly. Raise your hand if you know who the president is. (laughs) Everybody raises their hand. Right. Raise your hand if you know who your state senators are. And then you say, well, I know what, you know, and people were coming down. Even the best students in those classes, once you got down to the House, they didn't even realize we had a state general assembly. There's county commissioners. <laughs> there's, I mean, I know school, you know, but they don't know who anybody is. Yeah. And that's the work. It's like, don't just try to figure out what party they are and what you're going to vote for. Like, figure out who they are. Yeah. And they are public servants, which means you're supposed to be able to be in a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. They're at picnics. They're, you can set meetings. I mean, like, definitely know your people. Yeah. No, it's so true. We have so much that we don't even think about here in the United States that uh, is a privilege, mm-hmm. you know, to have the ability to vote. And um, thank God for the women, many of them women of faith who fought for that for us yeah. well over 100 years ago and that we get to enjoy that today. And unfortunately, many who still have to keep fighting. Because the barriers to voting are are tremendous. They're just, yeah. They're just really, really, really devastating. It, yeah. There's just so much. I mean, and it's not isolated to one or two parts of the United States. Like it's a it's a nationwide issue. Um, you know, we've even had things recently here in, in Southern California that are just really disturbing that are being said publicly in the news that are just blatantly racist. And yeah, we just need to uh we need to be aware as people who care about human flourishing around us. And of course people are busy and I understand that and not everybody can do everything, but hopefully just this um at least, like you said, low bar, low hanging fruit to just vote. That's coming up midterms. I know midterms don't seem like that big of a deal. And everybody says every election, this is the most important one. And so I'm going to say it again. This is the most important one. Please get out there and vote. If you're a U.S. citizen (laughs) or if you're voting from abroad, which I did for 20 years and it can be done. Um, Yes. That's impressive. Well, it's especially impressive when I was in Banda Aceh, Indonesia. That was like a mailed ballot back to California. And the mail is just like takes forever. But I did it because I care and I want to, you know, my voice to be heard. And like you said, we are grateful for the people who've gone before us, the women who fought and who um, really gave their bodies on behalf of that. They were literally mm-hmm. physically assaulted and hurt and mm-hmm. um, paid a great price being incarcerated and all that. And so like, I don't take it for granted. And I also, I have opinions and I think, you know, so often we're in spaces where nobody cares what you have to say and here's the one chance. So I know people around the world living in um, democratic nations feel the same way. I know that's not the case for everyone listening. Many people don't have the ability to vote wherever you are, but hopefully whatever level of civic engagement people can be involved in. Um, As people who care about their neighbors and their communities, this has been a challenge for them. So yes, in the U.S., please get out there early November, mail your ballot in early if you can in your state. But I wanted to end here with um, just a little bit of your vision, your imagination. You mentioned in your book a vision that had these words, the voices closest to the pain lead us until justice flows down the river with ease and righteousness is a nonstop life-giving stream, which you take that verse from the book of Amos, one of the most famous verses on social justice, which is such a beautiful verse that I'm going to actually be preaching on in Oakland next month. Um, Flesh out that vision for us, voices closest to the pain leading us and justice flowing down the river with ease and and righteousness is a nonstop life-giving stream. What does that look like for you? Yeah. So the book talks about decentering ourselves and joining the voices who are closest to the pain, the one who would be able to, I mean, if you, we're, we're trying to rehumanize, dehumanize, right? That's where you'll see injustice. When you see the dehumanized, you see injustice and really allowing them to lead the way. Um, you know, they have a very real and unique perspective and story that is a gift if they want to share and when they do share it's very powerful and I think it's easy to be misplaced in someone else's story and tears of guilt and shame that is not a place for that you know we want to put that aside I mean there's true lament Mm. but it's not about us lament isn't about how we feel guilty it's about the grief of shared solidarity for the lack of justice Mm. so that people who understand and are able to champion their own solutions that we 
would take them seriously, that we would not deny their dehumanization, that they, we would not deny that they know what they need, but that we would join them. And that metaphor in Amos is beautiful and that has sta- stood the test of time. I don't think many people even know it's from the Bible. Let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like a never ending stream. You know, that is a, a very common phrase from the margins. And it comes from the book of Amos. And without giving a whole lecture on (laughs) the prophet Amos, I'm so grateful that he gave us the vision of what should be. Mm. It's beautiful to watch a river flow. It's downstream, whether it's a big, you know, uh, big angle, I can't even think of the word, or just a a narrow, but streams flow down. Yeah. They flow downstream. That's kind of the whole purpose of them, right? (laughs) Right. They flow downstream. And it's, effortless. Mm. It is effortless. And that the way we were created for the connectivity, for the wholeness, that all of that, that everybody could live in peace and shalom, that kingdom of God context can come down with ease. Ah, what a relief. So until that happens, until righteousness, Sedekah, the Hebrew word, about our right acts towards people and towards structures become mishpat, become justice. So that's why they're together. They're, you see them linked a lot in the Bible, those two together, where, where the right acts of people become justice. When that is the norm and when that is the status quo, then our work is done. And the reason, so if you think about those waters flowing down, the status quo actually is injustice and yeah. unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And so the people of God and just the people with the spirit, I mean, like all people that are working, it's not just Christians who are working. I mean, often Christians are not working. Right. You know, the people who just know in their spirit, this is wrong. Yeah. And are walking against the currents of the status quo of complacency, injustice, dehumanization, oppression. Until that happens, until justice flows down, we are going to do the work of resisting. And the vision is that the first will become last, that the privileged and the power would go to the back of the line and allow the perceived last, and sometimes the real last, literal last would be first, and that we could walk with integrity towards justice, towards solution. I think of the word that old Hebrew word, selah, Mm. (laughs) this would be a break. Mm-hmm. that we could be at peace. So good. So nice to imagine and work for. It's worth working for because it's such a beautiful image. So nice and peaceful. Who doesn't love a good stream? It's on all the calendars that you buy. <laughs> like You basically want that every month of the year, right? Um, it sounds so great. Thank you so much for speaking into this for us all around the world listening. I'd love to point people once again to how they can find your writing. And so give us where we can find you. Yeah. So Ivory, IVP is my publisher. And so you can find both my books, The Power of Proximity and Join the Resistance on the IVP website. Of course, that free downloadable study guide with book number one is there. Um, just a, There's a link there. But you can buy this book anywhere books. I mean, any online place and hopefully in regular bookstores, you know, but I do know that people can ask their library to order it. So not only they can enjoy it, but others can enjoy it. So those are ways that you can find the book. You can always find me on my website. I'm, you know, I'm really good at responding to emails. Maybe I won't be, maybe there'll be so many, but I'm good (laughs) at responding. So you can find me at michelleferignowarren.com. And then I have a handle, um, at MCF Warren and on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Michelle Ferrigno Warren. So yeah. And I would love to be in touch. Wonderful. Yes. Everybody go follow the things that Michelle is putting out there on social media. Read this book. It's excellent. It's so needed and discuss it in your communities and let us know how you're interacting with it. I'm sure Michelle would love to know how you're interacting with it, even in so many different parts of the world and how you're seeing it from your perspective. Thanks so much for being on once again today, Michelle. It's just been an honor to have you on. Yeah. We'll have to have you back when you write another book because I feel like this is this is going right. to not be your last. <laughs> All right. Take care, Michelle. What an incredible episode with Michelle Ferrigner One. I'm inspired. I hope you're inspired wherever you are in the world to work toward 
social justice in all its forms in all the places and spaces where we work and live and play and breathe and are around other human beings to use whatever power we have, whatever privilege we have to whatever influence we have to make this world better together. And I think that so much of this podcast, we're hearing from thought leaders, we're hearing from people in the trenches, from authors, from from thought leaders, from people from so many perspectives. And what I love about Michelle Ferrigno Warren is she's got this street cred in terms of just having been there, right there in the middle of it all, but also has an ability to communicate that through writing and through her teaching and seminary and just the leadership. She's had a Christian Community Development Association for so many years, now her work with Virago and all that she does. She's at a stage in her career, in her life, in her journey, where she really is uh, such a person to draw from what she's learned, her mistakes that she's learned from, what she sees working well. And I really hope that you pick up her book because her book is full of all of this. Having read it myself and having seen her and just knowing her and other people that we're mutual friends with and just the work that she does. It's just her book, Join the Resistance. I know that you're going to glean so much from it as you learn personally how to step into the work of justice wherever you are and her faith-based perspective, whether or not you share the faith that Michelle shares, it does, it's just a it's a, a beautiful, peaceful perspective and what it can look like to work for harmony of all people, for us to all have inclusion and belonging, to all fully be welcomed in, in different spaces where some of us clearly are and some of us clearly aren't. The conversations she's having through this book and her stories and her experiences and all that she's learned through her own research is super helpful. And I really hope that you follow her, her writing, her teaching, and all that she's putting out there on We'll put all her links in, in the in the show notes, of course, as always. Anyway, so grateful for Michelle being back on today. And uh, this is your reminder, if you're a U.S. citizen, to get out there and either mail your ballot ahead of time or go show up at the polls on Election Day. These midterms are really important. It's one, you know, one way we can make a difference and it comes around every couple of years. So here's our chance. It's important if you can make it happen, and I hope that you can. Please let your voice be heard on behalf of yourself, your community, those who need us to be a voice for them in our in our nation, wherever we are as U.S. citizens abroad or who are living here in the United States. And my local elections here in the town where I live, so there's several propositions up here in California that mean a lot to me and my family and those that I care about that we're going to be voting on. And my oldest gets a chance to vote for the first time. So this is really exciting. He's seen us vote for years and is excited to be able to now cast his vote for the first time. And Gen Z has their own perspectives. I welcome them. I love what they're doing. I think they're challenging us. And I'm really excited to see what happens when Gen Z votes. So yeah, once again, whatever generation you're in, get out there and vote. And if you're a citizen of another country whose election's coming up and you're able to vote and that happens in your nation, I hope that you're doing that too. Until next time, everyone, keep making a difference wherever you are. Care for yourself. Take some deep breaths. Even the Navy SEALs have to do some deep breathing, so I hope you're doing that wherever you are. Breathing it in through your nose and out through your mouth as many times as it takes to just feel that calm in your body. Life is hard. The world can be dark sometimes, but I'm so grateful for each of you out there making a difference. Brings a smile to my face today. Have a great day, everyone. We'll talk next week. Bye. As we're finishing this episode, if you're thinking, I really wish I could learn more or go a little bit deeper. Well, that's what our Difference Maker community is for. I would love to welcome you in to join the rest of us there. Once again, um, it's only $5 a month to join the price of a latte at your local coffee shop. You can join at our Changers tier. Difference Makers is a community that really means so much to me. It's very special because each time I have a guest on the show, I record something um, outside of what we give to just the regular podcast audience where we go a little bit deeper and then I post those video episodes in this community and we can discuss them. But also at the very uh, beginning tier, which is our changers tier of this community, you'll get exclusive voting power and help pick podcast topics that give us you know, more of what we want from your perspective. You'll have access to exclusive um, 30 
plus mini sods that aren't out there for the general public. And you'll get every month an exclusive monthly bonus mini sode. At our Groundbreakers level, which is $10 a month, you can join and get all of that, but also priority access to submit questions to the podcast. And you'll get an additional two exclusive monthly bonus mini sodes. And at our Trailblazers tier, which is $15 a month, the price of three lattes a month, um, you can get all of that plus also three exclusive monthly bonus minisodes um, and a patron shout out. So I would love for you to join us at any of those tiers. Um, it'll help you come into this community, be in the midst of all of us, other difference makers, and we'd love to hear your perspective. I certainly would. It's a place to engage more with me and the audience around what you like, what you're resonating with, and once again, go deeper with each of our guests. So please join us in this membership community. I would love to hear your perspective and love to share this extra content with you. So show up at patreon.com slash a world of difference.